Melissa Shim writes, I need some tips for journaling. I really dislike journaling and will finish a layout without it. My intention is to finish the journaling later. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Any tips on how to make journaling a little easier and not so time consuming? Glitter Girl, can you help Melissa Shim write without worry? Of course I can. There are actually so many different journaling tips that I hope I can separate a few different things and give you a few different tips to take away and make it all make sense. But I would say take each step at one at a time and don't feel like you have to do everything all at once. So I'll say that up front. With product, that's the first thing that I would start to look for. And I would say to make your journaling easier, make sure that when you're shopping for product, you include looking for things that will help you with your journaling. I specifically look for papers like this one, which is from The Sweetest Thing by My Mind's Eye, which is a ledger print, which also has more to it. So I have all of this ledger paper, but I also have the potential to take this corner design and cut it out and use it um, as a beautiful embellishment on a layout. And it has a B-side that's really versatile because it's a polka dot and has a little bit of a shading to it and it's in a color that I would use. So this is the sort of paper that I will use every single square inch of because between those three elements, the ledger paper, the embellishment portion, and the B side, there's definitely something that I can use on all sorts of different layouts. And having lots of different printed ledger papers means that I always have something I can cut out and automatically have lines. I can just cut this into a piece that will fit whatever layout I'm working on and I'll be able to write straight onto it and that makes things really really easy. The next thing, after you've made sure that you have some products in your stash that will make journaling easy to write and will encourage you to write on your pages, is to consider your journaling as part of the layout construction. Whenever I'm making my page, the journaling is always part of my design. It's not an afterthought and it's not that I embellish everything and then the journaling is my final touch. My journaling is always something along the way. And I think if you get that sort of idea in your head, the journaling will be much easier because the layout won't be complete until it's already on the page. So to give you an example of that, today I'm scrapbooking with these two 4x6 photos. And I'm on craft cardstock because this is from uh, my travel album that's all on craft. So that decision was made for me already. And it also means that there's going to be a camera motif somewhere on the page. So I went ahead and chose this camera printed paper from Studio Calico's Freckled Fawn collection, which also has this kind of um, dusty teal star print on the back. So I'm going to use that. And then because there's red in the photos, I wanted to bring in some red as well. And there's this red dotty print from that same Freckled Fawn collection, which has a more neutral wood grain diagonal on the other side. So we're going to use those um, three papers plus that ledger print here. And I have one of the die cut, well, I've cut it out. It's a cut apart sheet from Freckled Fawn, and I used another square in the same sheet last week, I'm pretty sure. So this week I'm using this one that says you and me. So I'm just going to put this layout together um, to a point where I can show you how the journaling is always going to be part of my design element. I'm using this design as an example because I think if you're not used to including space in the layout design for journaling, that boxy styles of layouts are a really great place to start because it forces you to devote a whole portion of your page. It doesn't have to necessarily be this big, but it it forces you to devote one block in the page to journaling and nothing else. So in this case, I've used two 4x6 photos and then I've augmented that with two other boxes. That means that this one is 6x6 and this one is 4x4. So I end up with two squares and two rectangles, which put all together makes a square. Then I've matted all of that on the red print and I just added a little bit of glimmer mist around the edge of the frame because that's something that I've done throughout my travel album and I want to kind of keep that um, that little bit of continuity throughout the design. So now I get to my point where I decide how I'm going to add the writing, the title, and the embellishment. And I don't do that all in separate steps. I kind of do a little bit of each and move along. Now I know that I want to bring in a little bit more color and I have this die cut that I had started out with. This isn't going to be my title, but just a little bit of um, a, a little bit of an embellishment and I know there's only one person in the picture and that's why I wanted to use this because the journaling that I'm going to include here is about both of us but in this case 
he was in the picture and I was behind the camera. So I want to kind of include that on a, a, a written piece so that it bridges the gap between the pictures and the story I want to tell. So it's definitely something that I look for in my embellishment is I'm already thinking about how it will relate to the writing. Now this die cut brings in some orange and one thing that I like to do when I have a boxy layout is look for the edges and perhaps um, tidy them up a little bit by adding something that's not tidy at all. So in this case I didn't get this quite straight and um, so there's a tiny tiny little gap that you might not even notice depends on how much you're paying attention and I'm going to use that as a place to add some washi tape and bring in another color. So I'm bringing in some orange and this is an older Amy Tangerine washi tape that's no longer available but there are lots of different orange washi tapes in the store I just this is the one I happen to have so I'm going to go ahead and use that so if I'm thinking that this is going to go around here then I've brought the orange into this side of the page and it would be good to mirror that on the other side I don't want to cover up the person in the picture so I'll place this over to the corner and then I want to mirror this look so this ends just before the edge of the craft cardstock. It doesn't go over the edge. So I can do the same thing on this side. And it's just a smaller piece that way. And then sometimes I'll add a third piece because I tend to add things in threes. So I'll probably add something up here. This little piece that I tore off is too small. So I'll go ahead and commit to that now. The nice thing about washi tape is that if I decide this isn't a place where I want more embellishment, I can always come back and take it off and it's not going to um, it's not going to rip the paper underneath. Depends on the tape, but a true washi tape will come back up off the page. Um, some of the, the sturdier tapes that you can't see through, you need to kind of test it before you assume that you can't, uh, that you can pull it up off the page. So here's this kind of in-between point now where I have some places marked off for embellishment and I'm thinking that then this embellishment should include the title so that everything kind of large worded will end up here which means this is going to be my space for writing so this is the point where I'll go ahead and do that journaling because this gives me an out if I decide when I get to about here that I actually want the rest of this box to write my journaling I'll go ahead and keep writing because then I could move the title over here if I decide that this is enough room for the journaling and I don't need this extra space then this box will be fine just as a piece of pattern paper without much else on top of it because I'll add a little bit of embellishment here and a little bit here and this pattern paper will be fine on its own and I'll put the title here so I'm making those decisions along the way to make sure that I have flexibility in what I want to write so I'll go ahead and start my writing and see how it goes when it comes to actually composing your writing, a lot of advice will tell you to start with the who, what, when, where, and why if you have trouble getting started. And I have to say that it's not the advice that I would give. I tend to think that if you start with the who, what, when, where, why because you find the writing difficult, the, those five things are not going to help you unlock the story because of the things you already know. You know the people in the pictures, you know where they are, you're looking for the way to tell this story in a more interesting way than just listing out the facts. Now I suppose if you're finding it really 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 complicated to even get a sentence out then yes filling in the who what when where and why would give you the details behind the story but if you're really wanting to write something that is a little bit more engaging I wouldn't start with those particular things in mind. Instead I would imagine yourself telling a story to somebody out loud and in fact I don't think there's anything wrong with actually saying it out loud just even if there's not anybody there go ahead and ex look at those photos and try to remember the moment there are lots of different tips that I could go through and perhaps I can uh, link you up to some information below the video here but I think you should look at things like asking yourself questions beyond those five W's and um, asking yourself Mem what else was um, related to that memory. So in this case with the photos there are so many different ways I could tell you this story. 
these photos were both taken um, at the same time. They're just two different views. One includes the whole picture, including him, and one focuses in on this uh, random local dish. Now, I could just tell you what was in it, and if I wanted to do the who, what, when, where, and why, I would tell you that, that we were in a market in Cambodia and that this is a drink made of beans and sweetened condensed milk and ice and caramel. And that doesn't really tell you the story. I could tell you, you know, the why in that would be because it was there, because it was a hot day and this was the cold drink on offer. That doesn't really make for something that's very interesting. To me, the better story behind these photos is to give it context and perspective. And that involves going back before these photos were taken and adding in another memory. It might be that your story involves something that happened after these photos between the time when you make the layout and, and that past moment when you took the pictures. Or it might be something before the pictures. So in this example, the story really behind the, the reason that we took these photos was because this was something that we had um, been introduced to in another country a few weeks before and when we left that country we expected not to see it again because it was a regional dish and as we traveled out of that region even within the same country it became harder and harder to find but then we found a variation on it when we went into another country we were wandering around a market and spotted that this was a variation on that same dish that we'd been introduced to and really enjoyed um, somewhere else so of course we bought it to try this local version now giving you that perspective of the the story behind it that gives me something to write about that gives me something to tell you so I do still include the information about where we were so it still says that we were at a market in Phnom Penh in Cambodia it still says what's in the drink and it still um, basically gives you the idea that um, that we were at the market and bought it. That's really, really simple. But the better story behind that includes how we were introduced to it, and I've included all of that, So um, and how it became harder to find as we traveled throughout that, co that country but left that particular region, and then how we were surprised to find it in another country not all that far away. So... I think a lot of times if you, you stop trying to write about just that individual moment and give yourself the liberty of looking at perspectives and considering moments that happen both before and after that photo, you may find it much easier to tell a story. Okay, so I am going to um, link you up to some further resources uh, below the video, but or, or on two Ps, it'll be above the video, but there we go. Um, and because we could sit here and talk about this all day and I'm very conscious of the fact that now you're just looking at a half finished layout and my hands moving about. So why don't we finish this page and then maybe we'll talk a little bit at the end and I'll give you some further reading to um, help with more journaling ideas beyond the who, what, when, where, and uh, why. Okay, so in fact it did take me this whole box to write out the story that I wanted to include and in actuality I had the washi tape up one more line and I ran out of room so I picked up the washi tape I moved it down so that I could have that last little bit of space to finish my thought and that means that I need to take the title and move it over to here and I'm absolutely fine with that I've picked out three alphabets to make my title because I want to use three words and I'll just do each one in a different font so I'm using um, the map Everywhere Thickers uh, from Studio Calico and American Crafts, these small orange letter stickers from Acorn Avenue by Crate Paper, and then these are older letter stickers, but they were a good match um, to bring in some red, and these are older ones from Sassafras that aren't available anymore, but you might have them in your stash. So I'm going to um, add in my title here on this box, and then I'll be able to come back to these three spots and add embellishment. For my title, I actually ran short of letter Letters for the orange alphabet I didn't realize when I pull it out that I was already out of the letter O so I couldn't use all orange for in search of so I just added a tiny little tag in there with a, um, a little border that was a good match to this and just wrote that hand um, just wrote the word of by hand and layered it in so that will work if I run out of letters for tiny little words 
That leads me to a spot where I can work on the embellishment and I have these three areas um, to work with. This one gives me the most height. This one is quite small and this one has more horizontal space but not really any vertical space, not much beyond the tape. So I need to look for things that will fit in those spaces. And what I did was start to look at my embellishment stash and look for things that would match in color rather than just going to theme and trying to pull out travel embellishments or something like that. I actually started with one travel line and then when I put, put it next to this, the colors were completely clashing. And so I thought, oh, I'll go back and look for things with color first and then worry about whether or not they're going to be travel themed. So I first lo started looking for orange and then found that in my lab label stickers and things, on the rare instance that I do buy something that's orange, I use it because I found lots of sticker sheets where um, the, the outline would be orange but the sticker was already used. So I needed to go to another color and I had several of this yellow. Now it's from several different collections here, different pieces, but I just went through and looked um, at places where this particular yellow popped up. So this one's older, this is from Stella and Rose, but the other three are from uh, The Sweetest Thing, they're all by My Mind's Eye. So I have these two and this um, piece here. So those are all very similar shapes and sizes. So I could use one of those in each spot in some way. I'll need to get creative with how it can fit in here, but I think it has potential. So then I could also add a little bit more in the places where there's space for more embellishment. I could pull in things like this banner sticker here, which has the yellow and has um, just some script on, on a, a color that's quite close to craft. And I like looking for pieces like that amongst a sticker sheet that I would normally discount because this isn't a pink page it's not um, going to have doilies on it or anything like that but just that one little banner piece would be really useful here and this one has um, more journaling and um, more ledger type space and this is a, a border cut piece so that might be good to j even just use a little bit here and there and that yellow also came up in this shape which I could cut into pieces and use in more than one spot and this piece was quite neutral and therefore uh, might be useful. So I had all those different um, pieces in mind and then went looking for things with a bit more dimension. I had these paper clips from Studio Calico which have kind of a fabric-y um, a little pennant on the edge of a paper clip and that's something that's really small so it would be easy to tuck into the embellishment of each one of those things and there are at least three here that would coordinate with the colors so that was a potential. I pulled out some brads. I had these two from Basic Gray that had a red so that would give me something to pull there but I only had two with red but I had this yellow one from Crate Paper so I thought maybe two red and one yellow that gives me one for each spot. And then also some layered stickers um, from Amy Tangerine's uh, Ready, Ste Ready, Set, Go collection. And I'm um, not quite sure if I'll use these or not, but they were a good mix to the colors. And they had things like the little camera and even just the little sticker that said enjoy because I used the word enjoy in the journaling. So that could be a good mix. So I'm going to um, kind of figure out what will fit where and I'll start with those three label style stickers so that I can figure out um, what's best. And what I tend to do at this point is just lay things onto the page so that I can pull them up and move them around if necessary. So I could use this one on the vertical perhaps. So that might be best there, which leaves me this one for the top so I could add the date in up here. And if I place this over to the side, it gives me more room for embellishment rather than placing it right on top, which then limits me straight away. So I'll place this over to the side, but overlap it on the tape. And then I can just start to look at other little pieces that I can tuck into each one. So I'll take one paper clip for each one, one brad for each area of embellishment, and then I'll look at spots where I have a bit more that I could put into that mix. With the embellishment finished, this is what this layout looks like. So I just built a little bit of everything around each of those spots of embellishment. So everything 
in the completed page was really decided with the journaling in mind. I knew what story I wanted to tell about these photos, so that led me to pick this die cut. I knew that maybe either part or all of this box would be enough room to tell the story, so that gave me um, a design choice to, to choose a boxy type of um, layout. And then when I started looking at embellishments, I was looking for things um, that would roughly add up to um, to suit the story. This particular um, angle of journaling was to tell you the story behind this story, uh, behind these photos in a literal chronological sense. Let me tell you what happened before this that made these pictures important. So I wanted to show you a few other examples just to give you some things to think about that are different ways that you can make that same information. It's still the who, what, when, where, and why, but it's not limiting you to just what's in the picture and closing your mind to those other alternatives. So a few different examples, and these are from the same album as the page I just made, just different places in the storyline. And this one is quite a literal story behind the photo because these photos are um, a little bit different than what I would expect throughout my album and there's a story behind it. The story is um, who took them and I handed my camera to a little girl that was with us at that point in time, a friend's daughter, and these are the pictures that she took. So in the journaling, I could have just told you these pictures are a little bit different because they were taken by a six-year-old, but instead I wanted to focus my journaling on the little girl herself. So I have a title that says there's a story behind this photo, and the journaling starts with that story involves a little girl named Hattie. And the journaling tells you about Hattie, and it tells you about Hattie's attitude that day and what we could take away from it and, and what I liked about her and, and, you know, you can, the different things about her personality. Hattie's not in the pictures, and I didn't think that I needed to include her in the pictures just to tell this story. And I actually think that the pictures she snapped tell more about her personality once I was able to add that journaling. So just looking at perhaps who's behind the camera sometimes can be useful. And sometimes this line, I've used this title in different albums over time to explain that sometimes there's more than what you see in the picture that makes it something that I've scrapbooked. And maybe that's because I've taken a photo of something that's perhaps a little bit off the norm. I've taken a picture of, you know, just a stationary object or I've photographed my food or I've photographed a concert and it's not a birthday party, it's not Christmas, it's not one of those more traditional scrapbook events. Something a little different but it's still important to me and I can use this title to lead me into the journaling to tell you what is important, why did I take those pictures. This one um, is something that I use sometimes when I have photographed things that I see all the time. Now these pictures are not my everyday all the time, but when we were traveling, um, we only had two pairs of shoes and I had this one bag and I carried it everywhere. So these were the things that I saw all the time. I saw those shoes and I saw um, this bag all the time. So I wrote about um, those those items and what it was like to travel without so much stuff and how that was different from being at home and having a choice and choosing, you know, what bag am I going to take today? What shoes am I going to wear today? In this particular instance, there wasn't a choice. So you might have other things, that, perhaps not um, not dramatic, but things that you see all the time, things that are images that are normal to you. If I look at my windowsill right now, it's the same scene that I see all the time inside the windowsill, but it's a different scene as the seasons change outside the window. So that's another angle I could take with my writing. So look for things that are either a really odd sight, but also look for things that are really familiar because those are the sorts of everyday stories that we're more likely to tell in our scrapbooks now. And then this one last example for today, and that's to listen to the things that you say again and again, the things that actually come out of your mouth out loud. And the title of this page comes from that. When we were there, we were in this particular, this is in Melbourne, Australia, and we weren't in Melbourne very long, and um, 
perhaps not long enough to actually memorize the names of streets, but we were there long enough to get a sense of uh, where we were, and you get kind of nicknames for places. So whenever we meant to go to this place, which is actually called De Grave Street, we would just say, oh, let's go to that side street again, because that side street was filled with lots of different places that would be good to eat. There were bakeries, there were all sorts of cafes, and um, it was always a, a really lovely, lively place to people watch, but it also wasn't particularly too far for us to walk. It was it was just a really good spot. But we didn't know the name of the street, so we would always call it this. And it was only later when we were trying to explain to somebody who else somebody else who was on their way to Melbourne, oh, go to this place. There's lots of different good spots to eat. And um, we had to look up what the street was called because we realized to us this was that side street, but to them that wouldn't be any use until they got there and had been to that street and understood what it was. So we had to look up the real name. So the title of the page comes from something that we said over and over again. And that's what leads then into the story about why we kept coming back to the street and all the different things that we found there. And then this is one last tip to take away, and that's don't think of your title and your journaling as two separate things. It's all writing, it's all the writing on the page, and if you use it together, I find it could then be a lot easier to make that all happen. So my journaling often comes from my title. I have longer titles and the wording will then flow into the journaling, almost as if I've just taken the first sentence of my journaling and made it big. And I think that's an absolutely fine way to create a title and the journaling on a page. And then it helps all the writing flow. It seems all connected. And it gives you an easy way to start into the journaling because you've already started. You've done the hard part. You've put the title on. And likewise, if titles are complicated for you, this is a really good way to have a title built in. And you don't have to put this in your journaling and then come up with, oh, what am I going to title this? So that um, letting the two work together can be really, really useful. Now, last year, Glitter Girl did an episode uh, specifically about um, mistakes in handwriting and how to cover them up. And the quick answer is either cut a box and put it over the top and just layer things on top, or just kind of either go with the flow of it or, or um, write one letter a little bit heavier over the top, it's not the end of the world. And if you look at this page, you can see if you can cross your eyes. There is a mistake in this journaling, and I just went ahead and went with it. It's not a spelling mistake, so to speak. It's just, you know, when your hand kind of just makes an extra loop, and suddenly you're like, oh, that's really not what I meant to write. And that happens to all of us. I just left it. I just started the next word and I went on. And I don't think that it will cause me any trouble in reading what's there. Um, and I'm just... I'm just going to leave it. And I do that quite often. Um, so I wouldn't stress about it being absolutely per perfect. If you make a tiny little mistake, if you make an extra loop, don't worry about it. Just leave it. And then if you're having trouble with maybe a whole word went wrong or you look back and it doesn't make sense, have a look at that other video and, and you can see how sometimes I'll just go back in and actually make it a feature word by taking uh, rewriting it on another scrap of paper, put it in, and then if it looks too strange to just kind of put that box in, put it on pop dots, and then maybe do another couple words in there to uh, make it work. Now, your challenge for this week. Your challenge for this week is to handwrite your journaling on a page. And specifically, I don't know if you've noticed this yet this year, but we really would like you to tell us a bit about your creative process in that box when you describe your layout when you upload it. So upload your layout that has some journaling, and then tell us about why you made that choice or what was the angle that you chose behind your journaling or type it out so we can see it if it's not legible on the um, on the picture. So tell us a little bit about your motivation in writing on your page and we'll see if we can get some different ideas going um, that will get us beyond just the, just the facts and to see if we can make it a little bit easier to get all those stories written down. Thanks so much for watching. Join us next week for the continuing adventures of Glitter Girl and the ongoing mystery of the scrapbooker behind the mask at twopeasinabucket.com.